Welcome to the Like a Boss podcast, presented by the Portland Press Herald and sponsored by Bernstein Schur, New England cancer specialists, live and work in Maine, and People's United Bank. This episode was recorded live at the Like a Boss event at the Portland House of Music on March 10th, 2017. The guest is Mike Vale, president of Hannaford Supermarkets. Now here's your host, Portland Press Herald publisher and CEO, Lisa DeSisto. So our, our promise to you is that you will leave like a boss with a smile on your face, right, Mike? Can we do that? We'll try. Okay. So welcome to my guest, Mike Vale, president of Hannaford Supermarket, and welcome to all of you this morning. I am a little excited about this one because I love Hannaford. So I'm going to try not to be too much of a cheerleader, but um, I smile the whole time that I'm there. I really do. So, um, so let's um, get started, as we do, uh, by meeting the boss. So um, tell us about where you grew up. We'll start there. Well, just before I start, I mean, how about that video? Am I the most fortunate guy to have associates like that that uh, work for us? <clears throat> that, that entire campaign was, was uh, filmed and used all company associates. We had no actors. And, uh, and, and when, you, when you can appeal to people's emotion and, and what they're really passionate about, it's, uh, it comes right through in the camera. So uh, we've been really pleased. It's been our, our top performing uh, campaign and really supports our brand in a big way. Uh, so sorry, Lisa. I oh had, yeah, no, I that's, that's really fun. Of, uh, yeah, I was no, back there excited no. watching the video. Yeah, because when so, you uh, watch Leslie, you just you <laughs> smile when you see her. She it's infectious and it's yeah. and it's and it's real. So, okay, back to where you started. Um, so, uh, talk about where you grew up locally here, right? Yeah, so I'm a kind of a local Portland boy. Uh, grew up uh, here in Portland. Uh, went to Deering High School. Uh, went to college up at Colby, uh, 100 miles away and uh, uh, enjoyed, uh, loved Portland, uh, grew up and, and was very active in sports. Uh, I see some folks here, my old basketball coach is here, so I can't convince you that I was the star of the basketball team. Uh, <laughs> and some of my, some of my high school friends, so it's, uh, it's great to be back, uh, back in Portland. Yeah, so this is up. like a little Mike reunion. I well, met one of your yeah. roommates, and um, yeah, sure, college ba- your high school <laughs> basketball coach is here, and I, um, I asked how you were in basketball, and he said, he was a really good football player. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I also found out, so when you were on the basketball team, um, you made a connection with the team manager uh, who kept all the stats. And how yeah. did that all work out? I did all I could to, uh, to try to have her uh, pad my stats a little bit. But, uh, uh, but she wouldn't do that. And uh, at the end of the day, she became my wife. So, uh, uh, so in fact, Coach was more interested in seeing her than he was me. So, yeah, uh, that's, I, I, I don't want, I think that's why you weren't cut, by the way. So, but anyway, um, I'm glad that that worked out. I was the manager of our high school um, basketball team, and that didn't work out for me at all. <laughs> so I'm glad it worked out um, for you. So you went to Colby, and did you ever consider leaving Maine? Because once you get here, you don't want to leave, right? Yeah, I, I grew up, and, and, uh, and as I looked at schools, I did only look at New England schools. I looked at some schools in New Hampshire, but uh, Colby, Bates, Bowden, I knew I wanted to play uh, football in college, and, uh, and a Division three level seemed like the, the, the right level for me, and, and so I focused in, essentially in those schools and ultimately chose Colby and was uh, really excited about my time at Colby and both the athletics and the academics and the, the atmosphere and, and just being in Maine uh, was, was terrific. I'm, I'm assuming we have a couple Colby grads here, do we? <laughs> I don't know if we do. Oh, we well, we got one, one wave over there. Um, and so uh, what did you study while you were there? I studied, uh, so it's a liberal arts school. I studied economics and administrative science, which is sort of a proxy for a business major. Uh, and as I said, played football, really enjoyed uh, the, the football time. We had fraternities back then, and, uh, and they got, uh, they got uh, asked to leave campus after my junior year as a company, oh, so I'm not sure why, if I had anything to do with that. But, uh, I'm sure you did. <laughs> absolutely not. Uh, but I enjoyed, really enjoyed my time. In sports, you know, uh, uh, I, I'm a big fan of team sports and, and how that translates into business. And we've been, uh, we, we actively recruit folks that are, have been athletes, have been uh, involved with team sports. It, it, it aligns very closely with our work. Uh, we have large teams of, of associates in our stores, uh, the, the local Forest Avenue stores. Uh, I was talking to the manager a week ago, and, and he's up to over 350 associates in his store. And so uh, what it takes to be successful in a supermarket and to connect with people at all levels uh, and, and help them operate and, and do a great job and represent us like the, the folks did in that, uh, that video, uh, I've I found a strong connection to what you learn as part of a, being a, a team member and a team sport. And, and how you uh, have to all accomplish things together. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and I've been 
you know, for me personally, that has, that's helped me, and, I, and a lot of the folks we've recruited uh, have leaned into their experience as a team member yeah. uh, and, and found that that translates well into our business. So um, before we get into your first job at Hannaford, <clears throat> what was your first job? <laughs> Oddly enough, my very first job was, uh, you know, was sort of, uh, it was an illegal uh, young uh, person stocking groceries. Uh, so oh. my, uh, my next door neighbor, uh, the family next door owned a small independent grocery chain. Uh, they were in Wyndham and Bridgeton and Portland. And uh, uh, in the summertime, uh, four of us got in a car and drove up to Bridgeton and stocked groceries uh, three days a week and worked, uh, worked all day. So that was my first kind of tease into the business. And yeah. Uh, and then the following year when I was legal, uh, and I, uh, uh, I was, uh, my folks had a place up at Sebago and I needed to find a summer job and I went to sh both Shaw's and Hannaford were building stores and I went to both of them and got a job sorting bottles at uh, Shop and Save. Just a summer job, uh, worked, uh, but started working in the supermarket uh, when, I was, when I was 15. So, um, but now Clank does that, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> Absolutely. God bless. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Good. So you got to Hannaford through an internship through Colby, right? Yeah. How, how did that? Yeah, it was come great. So Colby has uh, we have typically two semesters, like most schools, but there's a Jan Plan program <laughs> at Colby, so it's a month of independent study. And back then, it wasn't real structured. You had to attend three out of the four years. Uh, you could really take uh, independent, do an independent project, and ski all month, frankly, if you wanted to, or you could do some take a class, or you could do some internships. And through my work at the store, I never would have thought. You know, a local supermarket would be a place I'd want to have a career. Uh, but I was looking to, to have uh, an internship, and uh, through my store manager, he connected me with a Colby alum that worked in the finance department at Hannaford. And uh, one thing led to another, and I had a month of independent study at the office in Scarborough. And I really started to see the business as a different business and what the industry was all about and what it could look like as a career. And that, that kind of piqued my interest at that point. So you've been with Hannaford for 30 years, <coughs> right? 31 which, years, what, yeah. yeah which, is amazing because most people don't have that kind of tenure, right, with one company. But you've had many different phases of, uh, of your career. Yeah, it almost feels like I'm almost apologizing for the fact that I've been with a company for 31 no. years. And uh, uh, but I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud of my t my time and tenure with our organization. Uh, and yeah, I, I really feel like I'm sort of in my fourth chapter. Uh, my first chapter was was 15 years at Hannaford. I came out of school, went on to a retail training program. Learned the business, spent seven years, eight years uh, learning the stores, running the stores, being the store manager in several stores. And then I moved into the buying operation and, and learned category management in the fresh side, uh, bought uh, seafood, meat, deli. Uh, people, I love, I'm a secret deli guy. I, I love deli. It was my, really? probably my favorite job at the company. Um, <laughs> but I had a 15-year base with the company. And then we, were, we, were, we merged. We were acquired by an international company. And they had other holdings in the U.S. And I had an opportunity to go down to Florida and work on a turnaround business. And uh, so I moved down in 2001 uh, with my family, uh, three young kids, uh, uh, you know, uh, not real excited about leaving Maine. And, and uh, we spent 12 years working on a turnaround business. And, uh, and that was really a different chapter for me. That was sort of more of an entrepreneurial chapter. We were uh, very much, you know, a challenger brand. In fact, we rebranded re the company worked really hard on that. And then, uh, and then about five years ago, I moved into a, our corporate office job in Charlotte, where I was the chief merchant and supply chain officer for the US businesses. Uh, so that was like kind of my third chapter. And then mm -hmm. the opportunity to come back to Hannaford uh, and run it after being gone you know, 13 years uh, was, was a great opportunity for me. Now, how did you um, get elevated to the role of president? So did they pick, like, did they pick you out, or did you have to apply? <laughs> I, I, hopefully it wasn't a big application process. I'm not sure I would get through that. But uh, uh, no, in Florida, I was the, the president of our business in Florida the last four years. And so I had experience as a president. And certainly there's a you know, talent planning process and mm -hmm. an evaluation process. They don't uh, take any of those, uh, assign anybody to those roles uh, lightly by yeah. any means. Uh, and then I was in the supply chain job and the merchant job at, in Charlotte. So uh, coming to Hannaford, I had, I had experience as a president and had, had run uh, the supply chain. So. Uh, when the opportunity came up to, to come back to Hannaford and, and work on this brand, it was uh, one that I was very excited, am very excited about. So h how many years were you gone from Maine? What was the... About yeah. 15. Okay. Yeah. So what's the biggest change that you've noticed in coming back? Portland's great. Uh, Maine is great. The population hasn't changed a lot. Uh, 
I, uh, a couple things. When I first came back, I knew we were going to be a little bit before we got, we built a house and, and really just moved in, in the last month. But I, uh, uh, I came back and said, geez, I'd like to live in the city, maybe the old port. So I was looking for apartments and someone said, you might want to take a look at the Eastern Prom. And I said, well, what's the Eastern Prom? And I knew it as the hill. And, uh, and so I said, I'm not sure I want to go live up on the hill. And, uh, but hol you do. Hol holy cow, right. the hill changed, right? Yeah. So uh, it really is the Eastern Prom. And so big change there and certainly the the uh, the city kind of the uh, the restaurant scene the the sophistication of downtown portland and southern maine has changed uh, quite dramatically and it's it's really terrific um have you noticed how much the newspapers improved <laughs> <laughs> every day yes. every day online uh, it has improved tremendously so available at checkout in hannaford <laughs> um, so give us an overview of hannaford how many stores how many associates yeah, so Hannaford's uh, 183 stores. Uh, we, we go across five states, uh, northern New England, upstate New York, uh, 26,000 associates. Uh, I think we have uh, about 8,000, uh, 60 odd stores, 8,000 people here in the state of Maine. Uh, you know, traditional supermarket in that sense, uh, uh, food, drug. Um, are, you the number one, are you the number one employer? I should know that. Yeah, we're yeah. the number one employer here in, in the state of Maine. Yeah, uh, thank you. For sure. Uh, and, uh, and we're really excited about the brand and where it's headed and, and where the customer's headed uh, with, with food. So we love the Hannaford brand here in Maine. Is it the same in New York or Massachusetts? I, I, do you have more challenges in those other markets? Yeah, yeah. I mean, a brand, uh, the brand is everything for us. And uh, certainly, uh, if you do a great job taking care of your brand and building your brand, uh, legacy and time and history helps that. You know, so folks like you or people that have lived in Maine and grown up with Hannaford, uh, you know, kind of have that, and, and we have a, a strong, strong brand. If we've done a good job, then the loyalty is, is that much stronger for our brand. Uh, we're a younger brand in a lot of other areas. So if you go to uh, the Albany market, we're about 25 years old in Albany. We are a number two share there in growing business, growing our share. Our brand is strong. Uh, in Massachusetts, we're a lower share player there. Uh, but even in the low share areas, our brand comes through. People absolutely identify us with having top quality fresh outstanding service uh, and, and, uh, and great variety. So, so our brand is, it does differ in, in, mm -hmm. in various areas, but I would say Maine, uh, we're clearly a number one share. New Hampshire, the Manchester market, most of New Hampshire is very strong for us. And Vermont is a really uh, a, a cool state and we're a number one share in Vermont. I was out in Burlington a couple weeks ago looking at new sites and uh, looking at our stores and uh, it's, a, it's a great market for us as well. So uh, I know you have three, I call them Mike's mantras, I don't know what you call them, <laughs> but um, the kind of principles that guide your actions as, as president, so let's walk through those. Yeah, there's this, this sort of, you know, three things that have evolved over my career and, and, uh, and things that I think are important for Hannaford and for our team here at Hannaford. And one of the ones is, is really this idea of, you know, a constant innovation, and I kind of call it the, kind of the curiosity to innovation continuum. And, and what I look for is, is we, always should, we should all be curious all the time about what we're doing. And curiosity doesn't mean a, a major radical shift from what we're doing, but, but how can I have my job be more efficient? How can I make a little more impact on the customer? How can I help my peer on one side or the other side uh, be more efficient and, 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 uh, and improve their work? And so that's that constant uh, curiosity that I look for. Innovation is probably the other, other end of the spectrum where we have a major initiative like our e-commerce business and we'll, 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 hire, we'll pull a team and isolate them and have them really work on that, uh, uh, that model as a truly innovative uh, product. Uh, but I really focus on the innovation and I look for that and I look for people that are being curious and trying new things and uh, as I've spent more time with the company, uh, folks will become more comfortable sharing with me, hey, we just tried this new product in the store and uh, maybe it didn't work, uh, but I really look for, I can't bet the farm on every idea, but I really look for people to be trying some things. We're not going to get better uh, with the assortment, with uh, meeting customer needs if we're not trying things. So that kind of curiosity to innovation, you know, theme is important to me. Uh, I also, you know, kind of, kind of look at this idea of competing. And, uh, and we take competition for granted. We're all in business and, and we all compete in some way to grow our business and grow our brand. And, Certainly, Hannaford has a long, long history of competing effectively. Uh, I talk to people about, you know, when I was a store manager, you know, you don't see too many store ma stores close. It doesn't happen all that often. It's a, it's a, 
uh, pretty stable business. But you know, if you talk to a store manager, we could be in a 20-year battle uh, with the store across the street trying to grab share, improve our offering. And oftentimes it goes back and forth. You gain a little, you lose a little. But gradually, if you're doing the right things, you, you start to pick up share uh, slowly but surely. And eventually that, that, uh, that store may go out of business and be closed. And, and, and fortunately, in most cases, we're on the, the successful side of that. And it, it takes, it's not like a basketball game that only goes on for 90 minutes. Uh, it's a 20-year competition, but it's a very intense competition. Our store managers are in our store in competition all the time. Same with them, checking prices, looking at service levels. Uh, and it, it, uh, it makes a big difference for us. And the idea of competing at a macro level, uh, you know, I, I learned a lot when I went down south. Uh, Steve Smith, I think, is in the audience. And Steve and I were peers, so he, he worked at Hannaford for several years. And we went down south as a challenger brand, and we were fighting uh, a very strong brand Publix down in Florida and trying to break through against them. And they were very similar market share and brand that we have, that we enjoy up here at Hannaford. And we made tremendous progress, uh, but going up against a, a top brand as a challenger, you learn how to compete at a different level than mm -hmm. when you're on top and you're sort of, you know, trying to continue to be a little bit better. And, and so as I came back to the, the, the company, there are our, our markets where we're not as strong as we are here in Portland yeah. and we're fighting for share. And, how aggressively are we willing to compete and really call out that competition for their weaknesses and really put a stake in the ground around the things that we believe in and, and, and really make a difference. So uh, competing is important to me. It's something that I learned, uh, as I said, back in my sports days. And, and I think you have to keep it front and center. And, uh, and, and I also, part of what I do is amplify. I amplify is good news. The things I'm looking for, I look for those things to be occurring in the office and I try to amplify those. So if I have a great example of where we're competing more aggressively, uh, then I try to make sure folks uh, are recognized for that, where people are being curious. Uh, and the third thing, which really I think kind of comes out of those two, is, is this idea of operating at full power. And, uh, uh, and, and you know, I, I look at my career, and there are times I was operating at full power. There's times that I wasn't at full power. And, and I've, I've spent a fair amount of time with our organizational development and training people and trying to kind of understand the dynamics of of what helps people work at full power, and, and it's that the work the work that you do is important. You know, you should love the work you're doing. Your boss is really important. You know, do you do you, do you have a good relationship with your boss, and does, does he or she uh, stimulate you and motivate you and support you? And the environment, the company that you work with, is important. Is this company one that I enjoy walking into every day, and the things they're doing, uh, the news that the, the, the what's the news the news is saying about them? Is that a company that I'm proud of? And, uh, and, and, and so the idea of kind of getting to full power is really important to me. And I think it, it gets us that discretionary effort from people. Uh, and we all have a bad day. I don't mm -hmm. mean it's full power, you know, all day, every day, although my people might disagree with me here. But, uh, <laughs> but, it's, uh, uh, but it's really about, you know, kind of, uh, kind of operating in that, at that, in that space and helping people get to that. Sometimes it's a different role and sometimes it's a different environment we need to put them in to, to really get them to full power. So uh, competing, um, innovation leads to a lot of, of change, and there's certainly been a lot of change in the grocery business with you know, Amazon delivering you toilet paper via drone. <laughs> I mean, the new competitors are, are propping up um, all the time. So I want to explore for a second your approach to leading change, because I think as a leader, you know, one of the hardest things is to, to get people to come along with you. So I want to hear about how you do that. Then let's go into the fun stuff, which is the innovation in grocery. Yeah, change management is a real skill. It's, uh, and let's face it, who wants to change, right? I mean, none of us sign up for change. And uh, it's, uh, you know, there's, there are a lot of models out there that we've studied and, and used. And it really, you know, change management really kind of follows, I hate to say it, kind of the stages of death, right? There's a, a denial and, and there's a sense of uh, why change? We don't need to. Things are going okay. Uh, and, and, and so you have to kind of work people through, you know, what is that... Uh, What's the proposition for change? How is this going to be better on the other side? Uh, are we in crisis, or is this an opportunity to get, get significantly better? And then you've got to kind of move people through this neutral zone where they're, they're sort of, uh, you know, understand that the past isn't going to work, but they're not entirely clear about what the future is and what that aspiration and vision is. And you've got to kind of manage people through that neutral zone and then, and then pull them into the new beginnings and, uh, and, 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 and start to provide evidence of what our new future could be like. And, we have models that we use, but it's really our team, and we have an incredibly talented organizational development team and, and resources at our disposal. So whether it's a, a restructure within the team or a major organizational restructure or change, 
uh, we, we employ those folks, uh, even for new innovation, to really kind of start to open their minds to what change possibility could be. So uh, Yeah, and a couple minutes we'll get to all your communication uh, tactics that I think really help reinforce change, <coughs> right, constantly. Just when you know think people are getting sick of it, you just you got to come come at them um, again. But let's talk about the fun stuff, which is innovation in grocery. So, you know, I am a huge Hannaford to go fan. I, it is a life changer. And let me just do my commercial for it. People are like, how does this work? And I'll be like, I say I want to eat my bananas today. I want to eat the avocado in two days. I mean, you can really be specific, and every single time they nail it. Plus, you can get alcohol. <laughs> so, and they bring it right out to your car, which is fantastic. Um, so talk about, like, why didn't someone think of this earlier? Who thought of it, and how's it going? Yeah, so, uh, so if you're not familiar with uh, what Lisa's talking about, we have a uh, kind of a sub-brand. It's called Hannaford to Go, and we, uh, it's, a, it's a fledgling business, and it's growing, and it's attached to our stores. We have it in 34 of our 181 stores today. Uh, it's uh, the closest stores we have in Yarmouth. Uh, we have it going into uh, the main mall store. And we have it going into a couple of our remodels down the coast uh, in the Saco Wells uh, area as well. Uh, but it's really been, we've been working on it for, for almost nine or ten years at a very uh, small, you know, kind of incubation phase. We are accelerating it pretty significantly. We opened 15 of them, 14 of them last year, and we'll open another six this year. And it really is, is uh, following the customer. The customer is clearly, uh, e-commerce is here to stay, and, and it's, the grocery business hasn't been the initial target of, you know, that, of Amazon, so to speak, but, but there is a clear need for people to be able to shop online and, and pick up their groceries. And as we went into this, we were very focused on the fact that this will be on brand. We will develop an e-com business that is the Hannaford brand and the Hannaford brand experience. And how will we uh, overcome some of the challenges? So folks may say, okay, I can... I'm okay ordering my groceries and ordering my, my bounty towels or my diapers or my peanut butter, but what about my produce and what about my fresh salmon and, and what about my deli meats, the way I want them sliced? And, and so we put a lot of time and effort into uh, how we uh, overcome that and how we deliver the brand experience. And in some ways, you know, we work so hard on it, the end result is it's almost been a layup. It's been almost easy to exceed expectations because others in that space have not done well with, with handling fresh. Our pickers uh, are, are incredibly sophisticated pickers. They, they are really represent you when they're shopping for that produce. We don't go and get the salmon until you know, 15 minutes before your scheduled you know, pick up at the store. We have hot units right up front for the hot rotisserie chickens. Uh, we really uh, bring those groceries out and deliver uh, above expectations sig significantly, particularly in fresh. And when I talked about competing earlier, uh, we, we not only is it competing against Shaw's or, or some of the other traditional retailers that we compete against, but, you know, competing against Amazon, and we know they're formidable, we know they are growing, we know they are, they are taking products away from us at this point, but there is no way they are going to outdo us in fresh. There's no way they're going to come in and, and figure out a way to deliver fresh products in a more effective way than we are. And we are very passionate about that and deliberate about that. And, you know, one of the fun things about innovation is we got into the e-com space and uh, we offer the entire store assortment. So if you shop in Yarmouth, everything that's in Yarmouth is online available to you in Yarmouth. The, the local products, uh, the niche products, you can, you can get the full shop experience. And, uh, um, but, but we've had to work hard at the ordering system and some of the mechanics. And, uh, but, you, you know, unless you jump into this space, you don't, you're never going to be perfect. Uh, and right. uh, I'm really proud of the team and the work we've done. It's a small team. We have less than 10 people that work directly on the e-com business. Uh, but it's a very uh, highly motivated team, and we celebrated our first uh, million-dollar week of uh, Hannaford to Go sales uh, back in December, and we've kind of shot through that milestone and continue to grow it every week, and it's, it's been really exciting. We do almost, uh, I don't want to give away too many trade secrets here, but, uh, you know, we, we see uh, average order size, so that the average amount of yeah. people buy is almost three times, so more than three times what our normal order size is. So when people take the time to go online and order, they sit down and they really do a full order. And so it's, a, it's very efficient that way for us. And we've seen some stores have become upwards of almost 10% of their sales are going through the e-commerce business. So, uh, so it's a challenge that way, and it's a, you'll see the carts in the stores. We try to do it during hours that aren't interfering mm -hmm. with our, our, our regular business. But uh, it's clearly a, a place where the customer is going and, and one that we're following. And one of the things that we're exploring also is 
the willingness to pay for service because you know we we're so diligent about keeping the price of Cheerios where they are and, and not raise prices for, for different services and and so as you look at these kinds of offerings obviously we're doing the picking and, and that costs us labor dollars uh, and we have certain fee structures but it's free above a certain amount and we've been exploring what consumers how do consumers value these services and I was in an, on an Uber ride of all things uh, a month ago in Charlotte and the guy was you know, he's probably 60, and he was talking about a, a person he had, a millennial, that he, that he uh, had riding with him. And he said, i got to ask you about, you know, this, 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 this experience I had. And he was, uh, I think, as part of Uber, they do Uber Eats, and somebody had ordered a hamburger at a nice hamburger place, but it was a 7 or $8 hamburger. It was going to be a 7 or $8 charge for Uber to deliver it. And then the guy, the, the person gave him a 5 or $6 tip. So this person just paid $21 for a hamburger to be delivered. And so he asked this millennial, he says, you know, he says, I know I'm only, if it was me, he says, I'm only here two or three years. Most of my furniture is from Ikea. I'm renting. Uh, for me, uh, I'll spend my money, and I don't even think about the service charge or the, uh, because I want the hamburger and I want it now, and, and it doesn't, it's a value to me. It, it, it achieves my value equation. So we try to take that thinking, and not that we want to charge a huge amount for, for e-commerce, but people see the value in that service, and the more they're willing to, uh, support it the more we can add to it and and uh, and grow that business but it's uh, it's been really successful for us and so that's one place where the customers headed and, and we're excited about you're it. not going to raise the service fee no we're Hanford not no. can I get grandfathered because you're you're good <laughs> I, I, um, I also wanted to say too that you can also get hot cooked lobsters <laughs> uh, through Hannaford to go they save your shopping list so you don't have to start from scratch each time uh, and once I was driving away and my cell phone rang and they're like you forgot your chicken my hot rotisserie chicken. <laughs> so I think the service has been amazing. And also we saw Leslie, your associate, that same customer service experience tra has translated right. seamlessly to the folks who, who are in to go. But one of the things I thought that was great we talked about is how the checkout process online and the change that you made based on, cus on customer feedback. Yeah, sort of little things. So when we first started this, we have scheduled pickup time, so we weren't real busy. So we, you know, you kind of, we kind of built it like you would shop. Okay, I go shop, and then I check out, and I, and I pay my groceries. And so we would, you'd go through the order process, and after you're done ordering, you'd pick your pickup, you know, the time you want to pick it up, and it was not an issue. Well, now things are getting busier, and, and because we want to deliver on the brand experience, we're very clear about how many customers we can take per hour in the pickup. We don't want to just have 20 cars lined up at 5 o'clock and then have someone having to wait too long. And so we started, people started to bump in and saying, wait a minute, I did my order. I have to pick it up Tuesday after work. The next slot wasn't until Wednesday midday. So I just wasted a half an hour to build this order because I need the, I need the product. And so, you know, we said, okay, well, we can fix that. So we put the pickup time now is the first thing you do. So you find out what the availability is. And then if that works, then terrific. Uh, if it doesn't work for you, then we don't waste your time. Right. You know, and, and on the other end, we're trying to expand out how can we process more people uh, efficiently, but uh, it's those kinds of, you know, you, in one hand you say, duh, why didn't we think of that at first, but, you know, uh, you sort of build these things in an iterative way. Yeah. Now, in Wednesday's Portland Press Herald, there was a story <laughs> about um, what I like to call misfit produce, um, and how you're bringing that out and selling it at a discount, mm -hmm. which, I mean, that was, was that not a great story? Yeah, it was a terrific story. The writers were, the, 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 the photography, the and, writing. And real facts, real facts. <laughs> Objective journalism, yes. Yeah, uh, so good. It was terrific. And, and what's really neat about that, I'll kind of connect that to the curiosity comment. So uh, I think I met Jim from Backyard Farms here, and, and we have a long relationship with Backyard, and we were one of the early supporters of that business and had an exclusive relationship uh, with them for a long time. And our buyers spent a lot of time up at Backyard. They develop uh, unique products for us and uh, signature products that we sell. But they also have, like any manufacturing environment, you have things that are seconds. And they don't quite come off the vine according to the spec that you want to sell them to. And we want the specs that we, we, we deserve. But they're still wholesome, very good product. And so we start asking and find out that, uh, you know, that may be going to a compost post pile or it may not be sold. And saying, geez, maybe there's a market here for that. Uh, that uh, as people, Particularly as people get more into organic and local, let's face it, our local tomatoes that come out of the ground don't always look perfect. But they're really terrific tomatoes and we're accustomed to eating those. And so we started to sell some off, uh, you know, off-brand, off-quality kind of backyard farms products. 
And then that led to this Misfit program, which is a much more uh, sort of inclusive of many categories. And it's really, uh, it's, it's, it's number one quality product. It's not product that's been sitting in the back room for a week and we, we call it a Misfit. But it's shaped a little bit odd or it's got a little dimple in it. And we've kind of sold that. And I think we're selling it at a 20, 25% discount from the regular products. And, uh, and people are, are really attracted to it and appreciate the product. And it's, it's doing well for us. So it kind of helps. It, we feel like it helps the, the customer have a better value from a yeah. price point of view. And it kind of helps the ecosystem around. We're all focused on sustainability uh, and, and making sure that all of our food, we know about the food waste uh, that happens in our society and how can more of the food go into feeding people in, 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 a, in a much more as efficient way as we can, uh, an efficient po process as possible. And we, we have a big responsibility for that. So we're excited about the right. Misfit program. Right, everyone seems our to Our goal be. is to drive more produce sales as a result. And, yeah. uh, and so far, so good. So let's transition to local then. Um, that's something that's so important to Hannaford. I think you have... Six thousand local products that yeah, you that you right. offer. Um, how do you how do you keep track of all yeah, that? Yeah, local is a big part of our strategy. It's the newest element of our strategy that we've probably had for seven or eight years now. And in all honesty, when I came back to Hannaford, I was doing my own sort of SWOT analysis. What are the good things about the brand? What are the bad things? And I'd heard about local, and I knew, and I and I thought this might. I, and, and I know Chips here, my our marketing folks. I said this this feels like it might be more of a marketing uh, campaign than it is real uh, in terms of local. And boy, was I surprised when I got up here and really started to shop the stores. Uh, the local assortment that we have, uh, the penetration, the sales of our local products are amazing. Uh, I tell people that, uh, and this is the other thing that's different about Portland, is it's a pretty big uh, uh, craft beer market mm -hmm. as well. So we have a lot of producers of beer. Uh, 52, over 52% 52 of our beer sales at Hannaford are now craft beers and microbrews. And so... You know, 10 years ago, Anheuser-Busch was, was commanding almost a 50 share of the entire beer business just by themselves. So you go in and see Coors, Miller & Beer, and Budweiser, they're kind of tucked in the corner, and you see all these craft beers. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's deeply penetrated. And John's spaghetti sauce is in all the Portland stores. Uh, and it's not easy to do. We have, you know, as you said, over 6,000 items. So we have 183 stores, over 600 suppliers that we work with. Uh, in produce particularly, you have to have, be certified in order to sell and, and meet all the health requirements and, and growing requirements that we have. We actually fund through sort of a scholarship program. We help local farmers get through the paperwork and, 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 and get the insurances that they need so they can sell to us. It's a very complicated uh, and, and difficult thing to execute, but it, it goes very well for us. And my little story on this is, so I told you I was here for a year before I got into my house. And uh, so I didn't always cook at home, and uh, I was at uh, the local Sebago brew here one night, eating at the bar, minding my own business by myself, and the bartender was uh, talking to another customer, and the customer was talking about uh, buying local products and, and, and where they would go, and the bartender immediately jumped in and, and jumped in and said, Hannaford is the place to go for local products. They are support the local community. <laughs> I was just loving that. I'm just minding my own business, and there's, uh, you know, I got to pull that guy into our next commercial, so... Uh, uh, local is real at Hannaford. It's, it's, it's real to our customers. And much like organic, it's, it's not sort of a fad. I mean, people really are focused on supporting the local community, and, and we're doing our part to, uh, to really drive that business. And it's, it's a real strength of our brand at this point. For sure it is. So Amy's giving me the hook. I've got like five minutes left, and I feel like I'm in eight items or less, and I have a full card of questions. I don't, so I gotta, I gotta, I gotta move ahead or sneak a couple of, <laughs> sneak a couple through. Who's done that? Like, you know, like oh, is it really 14? Um, okay, so. We know your type. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, if it's a bag of oranges, do you count oh. that as one or do you count it as six? Don't even go there, Lisa. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk about recruiting talent to Hannaford. So how do you make working at a grocery chain seem exciting? Yeah, so it's, uh, I, I, as a product of a, our college training program, we have a, an outstanding retail management training program. We hire upwards of 10 to 12 folks a year. In fact, we had 20 recruits in a week ago Monday, and I got to go spend some time with them. It was uh, nice to see them all nervous and excited and in their first big kind of job interview. Uh, what, what I try to do, you know, let's face it, the supermarket business isn't the sexiest business out there, and... Uh, and, and if, uh, for some of you that might be closer to my age, uh, when I was at Colby and I'd already accepted a job at Colby and I was uh, shopping with my college roommates because we lived downtown in Waterville, uh, the Mr. Whipple commercials were out there for one of the... the Charmin. Charmin, yeah. 
And so, uh, you know, the grief I got from my buddies, they might be going to, into banking or going into insurance or into, you know, tech, and here I am going to go work for the supermarket, and, you know, they'd be talking to me about cleaning the, the broken, you know, the broken glass on the floor or squeezing the Charmin, and uh, so, so not the sexiest business when you're kind of coming out of school. Uh, but I'm excited about the business, and, and all of us that work at the company are excited. And what I really do is, is I, I, I talk about the business and, and, and what kind of a share we have and how innovative we are and how we develop. But I also peel back the facade, and I say, if you come to work for Hannaford and you go through this training program, you, for one, you're going to have a full year of indi indi individual development and, and learning. So your only responsibility is to learn through the training program. We literally put you in a deli for eight weeks and a meat department for six weeks and produce all the way around the store, work on the cashiering, so you understand what, 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 how things are done. But a year out, you're going to be responsible. You're going to have 40 or 50 people directly reporting to you. You're going to have labor expenses of a significant amount of money. You're going to have profit expectations uh, in the millions of dollars for that store within the areas you're responsible for. Uh, so the accountability and responsibility that we give to our folks early in their career is pretty amazing. And, and then you sort of can build from there as you develop your career further. The other piece for Hannaford is we're very focused on people having varied responsibilities. So we don't hire somebody to come in and run a store and that's their entire career. Sometimes people say that's my passion, that's where my full power is, and that's what yeah. I want to do, and we fully support that. But we also have people that come in and, and work at retail. Uh, I like to have all of our folks get their store manager badge uh, before they come into corporate. That doesn't always work out because some people want to you know, go into a defined area, and that's fine as well. But if you have your badge, you know, you've kind of experienced everything that can happen at the store, and then all the wonderful things we do out of the office for, to support the stores, uh, you can have a good lens around that. Uh, um, but then we also encourage people to go into, uh, into different areas. So I was fortunate enough to go into the buying side of the business, and, and so, you know, uh, I spent seven or eight years buying deli and seafood and meat, and I worked in the stores, and I've had opportunities to work in other departments as well. So people that work at the company enjoy through their career the ability to work in different disciplines and then kind of weave that together uh, to help them to be stronger leaders and, and more effective. So recruiting the younger folks is, is pretty easy for us. Yeah. And we do really well with people that are um, kind of had their first career maybe in the, the intensity of New York City or Boston and they, they also understand Maine and want to kind of Kind of, kind of balance their life a little bit and come back and, and still operate at full power but, but live in a community like we have in southern Maine. Uh, a little challenging to sort of get the, the, the folks that are kind of in the middle there that, to, to sort of relocate to Portland if they don't know Portland and, mm -hmm. and there are other parts of the country. We, we have to sell a little bit uh, to help them understand uh, uh, the beauty of southern Maine and Portland. But. Um, so before we go to questions, let's talk about uh, communication tactics. So I know you, you have a lot of associates, <laughs> a lot of stores. What are some ways you can consistently get messages out to people? Yeah, you know, a big part of my job is, is to amplify all the great things that we're doing and, and pr create momentum, as I talked earlier, about the things that are important to us that align with our strategies and our goals. And, uh, you know, I've just sort of developed over the years uh, through experiences and, uh, and really worked with our comms group to say, how do we have a, a kind of an integrated communication plan here that I can execute? Uh, some of it in a very much a planned basis and some of it very much ad hoc. So, you know, we have quarterly communication meetings with large groups of people. We have newsletters we've put together. Uh, we've got podcasts that I'm, I'm uh, working on and, and we'll pick a topic like diversity and inclusion and talk about uh, uh, that for half an hour and we get different folks that, that use those tools. And one that I, I've kind of brought and, and it's just one that, that I picked up and I think there's tremendous uh, benefit to it is is kind of these ad hoc, you know, kind of uh, huddles. And uh, uh, so we have the big communication area in our building, but we also have a little atrium area that can hold a pretty good amount of folks. And, and uh, so when something great happens in the company, when we hit our million dollar week for Hannaford to go, uh, the, next, the next day I said, I want to have a huddle. And, and, and so I asked the, uh, the, the, my assistant if we could open the phone so I could call a huddle. I want to do it myself. And she said, the phones don't do that up here. We can't do that. And, uh, <laughs> So I said, well, where do we do it? And she said, well, down in the lobby. So I went down the lobby and, and got, the, got the phones opened up and called a huddle. And, and I called it at 10 minutes of 10 and said, hey, let's have a huddle at the atrium in 10 minutes. And I try to be mindful not to do it too often, mindful of people's schedules and try to do it on the hour when, when people are in between. But quick huddle, people come together. And I like to spend five or six minutes letting people, because all of a sudden the, the energy starts to pick up. People are talking, waiting for the huddle. 
And then it's literally, there's no microphones. It's really just uh, celebrating uh, something that just, we just accomplished as a company, uh, uh, celebrating the person that might have, might have caused that to occur, and really getting some good energy for people to kind of, uh, kind of pick that up. And it's, it's, it's worked out really well for us and worked well for me in terms of amplifying messages and mm -hmm. keeping the energy up. Um, how much time do you spend out in the stores, and do they know when you're coming, or do they know when you walk in? Like, is everyone cleaning, cleaning up? You know, how does, how does that work? Uh, it depends. Uh, so uh, there are times that uh, I've had to sort of get comfortable that I'm the president of the company, and, and uh, that's sort of a big deal for some of the folks. Uh, I, I still am Mike, the you know, store manager or the person that bought the deli years ago, and I love to be in the stores. That's where I get my juice, and, uh, uh, and so I, I try not to make myself out to be a big deal, but it is a big deal, and when I don't get, particularly when I get out to Vermont or, or upstate New York or even upstate Maine, uh, they don't get to see the president all that often, so they, they're proud about that and they want to show off, and there's nothing better than to walk a store with a store manager when he or she are proud of what they've done, the merchandising, the, uh, what they're doing to try to, to win sales and, and grow their customer count. It's, it's really an exciting, and I'm honored to do that. <laughs> well, two weeks ago, I was out in Burlington, and uh, actually, I was undercover uh, and and secret I was shopper. a secret shopper in jeans, and I was out with our real estate folks because we're looking at some acquisition opportunities out there, and so we were kind of uh, shopping undercover. But we went into one of our stores at, uh, and I know one of my guys ratted me out and told people we were coming. So, <laughs> um, so we went into one of our stores, and it was 7:30 at night, and uh, we walked in, and and the, the management team was still there, and uh, the bakery manager was, and I was trying to make it a quick walk because I knew you know, it was it was later, and. The bakery manager told me she had been there since 5 in the morning. And, uh, and what that meant to me, because I knew she was there because I was coming. And, and, uh, and so we, I said, whoa, stop. So we went back and we walked her entire bakery department and spent 25 minutes uh, having to show me the things she was proud of, the work she's done, a little bit of her experience. So it, it is a big deal when I come to visit. And, and it means a lot to the folks. And it, it uh, means a lot to me. On the other side, I do, you know, shop in our stores every week, and I visit our stores every week, and I'm not always there on official business. And I get to see the stores the way they operate, and, yeah. and they operate very well. We always have our opportunities, but our, we have really talented folks, and it's, uh, it's great to be in the stores. Oh, tell, tell me, the, uh, or tell them, the story about um, how you had this sort of failed experiment in the front of the store with uh, the way you queued people <laughs> up. Because, I think you know, people, people love to hear from leaders' mistakes, yeah. about leaders' mistakes. <laughs> So we tried uh, this cue buster technique, and you sort of see it at the bookstores where you kind of wait in line and you wait for the next, the next cashier to be available. And so we thought, hey, that may be a great idea for us. We think we could be more efficient. I mean, how many people have had that bad line, right? You get in the line, and it's like, <laughs> oh, my gosh, why did I get in that line? That customer ahead of me or the cashier, and, and you just, you just it's ready the to shoot yourself, it's right? It's always the customer, not the cashier. <laughs> well, once in a while, we slip up a little bit. And... Um, and so you thought, hey, we can avoid this if there's a problem. There's always going to be something that comes up. We can move people to a different line. So we built this queue buster system, and, uh, and, and we executed it uh, in several stores for quite a while. And, and we found a few things. One of the things we found is that it did work efficiently. You had to be patient and give it some time because, uh, you know, rather than be number five in line, there might be 20 people ahead of you, but there's four or five registers or uh, hopefully 10 registers running, and, uh, and, and you go quickly. But when you first walk up to a line of 20 people, you get frustrated, say, I'm going to be here for a long time. And, and so that we had to overcome that. One of the things that, I, that we were surprised about and in, 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 in ultimately you know, led to us kind of unraveling it was you, know, you saw the people on this commercial, and, and our customers get to know uh, their, the associates, and they have their favorite cashier or their service clerk, and they want to be in the line for that person. And the queue busting system didn't allow for that because there was someone directing you to different lines and you couldn't get in the line you wanted to and work with the person you wanted to. So there was an interesting human dynamic as well as an efficiency piece that, uh, that, that kind of led to our unraveling of that, that experiment. So yeah. they don't all work, but we were being curious yeah. and, uh, and innovative. Well, I think it underscores, though, everything that you do is really focused on, on the customer and improving the yeah. experience for the customer. That always freaks me out, though, when you're in the queue and you're like, oh, <laughs> oh am I in five? Am I, is the light on at six? <laughs> I don't like it either. So, uh, Okay, our cl uh, classic uh, like a boss question is what keeps you up at night? Uh, t two things, you know, really kind of keep me up. Uh, we are charged with the incredible responsibility of keeping your, your food safe and making sure you have confidence that when you get home that that food is going to be uh, having been taken care of. 
Temperatures are incredibly important through the cold chain and, and making sure we take care of products. So food safety, we train our people incredibly well. We have audit procedures and uh, people that check on all of that, uh, but it's really important to us and, and that's sort of job number one. The other piece is, is this kind of incredible, re probably the biggest responsibility I feel like I have is to protect our brand. And, and our brand is everything. And uh, I, I know you warned me. Uh, the, the, you know, I think about the, the most powerful brand, again, I go to sports analogies, is uh, the NFL brand. So, you know, I, I kind of think about protect the shield. And Roger Goodell isn't the most popular guy here in New England. Um, and I'm not suggesting he's doing a great job. But, but, his, great jo you, but, but his job is to protect that shield. That NFL shield is worth billions and billions of dollars, and the, the 32 owners charge him with protecting that shield. And I feel like that's a big part of my responsibility is protect that shield, our Hannaford Cornucopia, what it stands for, how we deliver against that on the product side, on the value side, and the service side, and our store conditions is critically important, and that keeps me up at night in terms of, you know, on the positive side, how do I develop that shield and that brand even stronger? but then really kind of make sure that collectively all 26,000 of us are protecting the shield, and that is the Hannaford Shield. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Now, when Steve Smith was here, and when he worked at Hannaford, he said when he would go to people's houses, he <laughs> would look in their cupboards to make sure that they had the Hannaford brand. So I'm figuring you're doing the same thing, right? I mean, it's, it's just one of those things that's in our DNA. So, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, within about five minutes, I'll know who you shop, where you shop. You can't hide it. So uh, uh, you can tell me all you want in this kind of environment, but I'll know as soon as I walk in. Uh, and, uh, and, and I'll also see if those shelves are lined up and straight as well. And yeah. Labels turned out and organized. So, uh, oh, can you come? Uh, organize my pantry. It's all Hannaford brands. That okay, would be, you can tell me that, that on stage, Lisa. But yeah. uh, but I'll know for sure when you I come here. You know you house. will. Yeah, and you, and you will not. You you won't find any. I'm I'm legit. I'm, I am legit Hannaford. Is she overselling here? Uh, no. I, I, yeah, I feel like I'm backpedaling a little bit, but no. Um, do you cut produce? Do you cut fruit in the um, Yarmouth store? So we are, we, we're, you know, absolutely moving in that direction as well uh, into more intensity around uh, how product how customers want products. And uh, so we've adopted, a, we've been into a fresh cut fruit program now for a couple of years, tremendous uh, uh, reception to that. We're also moving aggressively into cut vegetables. And uh, that's, and we're not the only ones doing that. You'll see that in other, other places as well. We have a concept store in Bedford, New Hampshire. I wish I could just sort of uh, magically bring it here to Portland so you could see it. It's a fabulous store for us. It's our newest and greatest prototype. And uh, one of the things that we have a kiosk in produce, and uh, the cut fruit took right off. We knew it was going to do well. We've been doing well with that uh, in, in a lot of our stores. Infused water and, and different pressed uh, juices are doing well. But the cut veg program is amazing. Not only do we have it pre-packed, but we also have, you know, kind of a little sign that says, you know, pick out your, your, your produce and we'll cut it for you. And we didn't think too much about that, but I went to our Bedford store after Thanksgiving, and the store manager said, you can't believe how many squashes we were cutting oh, and yeah. how many, you know, Turnips how much product impossible. we were in. Uh, <laughs> and so we, we, uh, we're making a lot of friends with that and, uh, and driving a lot of business. And so we constantly look at those value-added services and find out how can we, because people don't always want to buy the pre-cut product. They want to pick their product and, right. and have it processed. And we'll do that in the meat department as well, but uh, it's a, a place where people are, absolutely attracted to that. I think the Press Herald actually wrote a story about the Bedford Concept Store, didn't we? <laughs> I, it, it's just ironic. And you can find it through the Google. Use the Google, Bedford, Hannaford. We had a great day. Right? Craig, Craig the, the, your writer, was terrific. And we had a great day going to Bedford. And we also have a, so for this Bedford store is a, you know, excuse me for square footage talk, but we have about a 70,000 square foot store, which is on the big side for us in Bedford. And it's got all the bells and whistles. It has a kitchen. It has a cafe, Wi-Fi, expanded fresh, big wine department, all kinds of really cool things. On the other side of the spectrum, a year and a half ago, we opened a store in South Berwick, Maine. I don't know if anybody's from southern Maine. Uh, that's a 20,000-square-foot store. So it's probably a quarter the size of the Forest Avenue store. And it's a full shop uh, store. You can get all produce, meat, deli, groceries. We don't have a pharmacy in there at this point. That's our biggest complaint. Uh, but it's doing incredibly well, and it kind of, again, speaks to this local nature. People are looking to simplify their lives. How can I do my regular shopping in a more efficient way? And uh, it's a great opportunity for us to think about even smaller stores that we can put into small towns uh, and really meet a different need for consumers. So. Great. 
Amy, are you ready to take some questions? All right, let's do this. Oh, we got one way in the back, way in the back. I'll repeat that question, which is, what books have influenced your um, management style the most, and what book do you give out, assuming you give gifts, <laughs> uh, what book do you give out most to your, to your team? I have a, um, I sort of have a tutorial book that I give to folks. It's, a, it's, it's really a fairly basic, but it's really effective on quick reads on quick topics called the Successful Manager's Handbook, and it covers a wheel of, of uh, skills, and, uh, and it kind of jumps you into other... Uh, other uh, books, if you want to read deeply into a topic, but that's a, a really a functional book that I that I that I hand out to people. Uh, I, you know, I I, I wouldn't say I'm a, a, I don't, I read a ton of the business books. I certainly have over the years. The big one, Good to Great, was one that we continue to to, to use a lot and, and spend a lot of time on it. Uh, I've i tend to study leaders and uh, and their brands and and what they've done. I. It's a little bit dated now, but Steve Jobs' book around, you know, his, he's a, you know, a very dysfunctional man in, in terms of his personal leadership style and his person was very complex, but the passion he had for his product and his brand and how he brought that forward and, and, and how maniacal he was with his team about how that brand would translate to a consumer, uh, I think there were a ton of lessons there. I, I've, uh, you know, studied Bill Belichick and how his brand, you know, on the sports field uh, kind of leads to... Uh, the way they operate as a team and how that translates to to their success on the field and and uh, this is a dangerous one to put out there given the current political environment but long before he ran for president and became president uh, Donald Trump's brand if you think about his brand and, and what it stands for I uh, moved into a community in Charlotte four years ago and just as I was moving in it's a golf community he bought the, the club and what we saw and experienced uh, as a club in terms of the quality of the facilities the level of service, the, the, the execution of that club was very much kind of on brand if you think about a premium brand and what that delivers. And, and so what I think about is how do leaders, you know, develop a brand and, and whether it's in due to the, tied to their personal brand or tied to how they run their businesses, how does that translate into the success of the businesses? And so that's, that's probably an area that I focus, you know, kind of more on is, is the great leaders and how they've, they've built a brand and, and delivered that brand. Where are we now? Amy, where are you? Oh, okay. Hi, Hi Mike. Um, question I have is related to uh, recruiting. How do you deal with non-management recruiting for your associates? Um, that seems to be one of the bigger challenges in, in the state at this time. Yeah, it's, a, it's a very difficult for us. I spend a lot of time with uh, our store managers uh, in terms of how we recruit at the entry level. Uh, certainly minimum wage, we all see the, the pressures that have been on minimum wage, the, the minimum wages that have been raised. We used to have a competitive advantage around wages, entry wages. We always were about 20% higher than, than the other folks. So we've been challenged in continuing to do that with the, with the legislative changes that have occurred. We, uh, we work really hard to, we have, we have you know, full-time social relations managers in our stores that are there to take care of our people. And, and really recruit uh, almost full time. In a lot of our stores, it's very difficult, particularly seasonal stores. We start hiring early, and then we, we don't have the business until the summertime really kicks in. So trying to keep people on board, it's very challenging. Uh, but we, try to, we do try to sell an opportunity, an environment, uh, a potential to expand your career. And, uh, and one of the things I learned a lot in my early days as a trainee is, you know, we're, we're very much, you know, kind of a, you know, I was coming into a white collar job and a white collar business, uh, but we really run a blue collar. We have a blue collar workforce. I mean, these folks are hardworking, salt of the earth, earth folks, and uh, it's very important to be able to kind of connect and and lead at their level and create an environment that. Uh, and I don't mean it in a in, in the way it might sound, but really, how do I connect with people uh, in in their values and and their hard work and 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 work alongside them? And have them enjoy the work that they do, and their managers work alongside them and enjoy the work they do as well. So we try to create a positive environment. We try to have flexible schedules. Technology is helping us a lot with preferred schedules and and and, and, and helping people balance their personal needs. Try to be a lot more flexible around 
uh, we're, uh, you know, trying to have our dress codes and our personal uh, kind of uh, um, um, appearance codes be more on trend with consumers and make sure that we have a, uh, an attractive place to work. But it's, uh, it's, not, it's not easy. It's a very difficult issue for us right now. How do you maintain the uh, uniformity of the brand experience as you grow throughout the state and other states so that uh, the consumer has the same Hannaford experience, whether they're going to New Hampshire or Maine? And then how do you inform your staff, since you can't be at every store, how to expound that to their staff and the value of it and the importance of it? Yeah, great question. Uh, the brand is, as I said, is, is critically important to me and it is to our staff. When we open a new market, we absolutely open it on brand and, and make sure that we uh, seed the brand in a way that, that is consistent with what we expect. And we charge our stores, uh, we, d we train and develop our stores and all of our associates on brand. All of our training materials uh, are, are, are aligned against our brand. We have, uh, in technology today, we, we, we really are able to get uh, pretty quick reads on all of our markets and all of our stores around uh, our net promoter score and, and how people see the brand and if we're scoring uh, as high as we need to in the areas that we expect to. And we have a pretty quick way to be able to go in and, and, uh, and attack an area of produce. Our produce scores aren't coming out the way we expect them to or our cleanliness scores or community. Uh, you know, that, that, that we, we can go back pretty quickly if those aren't performing where we need them to be. And one of the things that we didn't talk about was our Hannaford Helps, which is uh, really our umbrella to community giving. Uh, we're a very strong it, it, community. is very important to us, uh, certainly as a major employer here in Portland uh, out of our corporate office. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's very important to us here in the, in the southern Maine community, in the Maine community. But we, we also enroll our associates in all of our communities around Hannaford Helps and really make sure that that comes through. We think that's a great way to build our brand uh, in, our, in, in the new market. So uh, it's not the same strength in every single market, but it's directionally all of our materials and hiring and uh, brand work all, all really you know, look to achieve the same objective in all of our markets. First, thank you. Good morning. Appreciate this forum. Lisa, nice job. Mike, welcome back to Maine. Um, I'm speaking as a consumer. Please, please, please get a store in Falmouth. <laughs> please. <laughs> Every day we are desperately needing a Hannaford somewhere along that strip. Well, there's Thanks. one in West Falmouth. A uh, long way from the Route yeah. 1 side. <laughs> so you have a fan. You have a supporter. I, uh, I am living in, uh, on the Cumberland-Falmouth line uh, along where you talk. And, uh, I've already been to our real estate people and said, why don't we have a store along Route 1? And uh, we looked at the interchange where they're going to change the highway there, and we couldn't quite fit one on uh, there. But we are, we're working hard on that. We do have one in West Falmouth that's terrific, and Portland and Yarmouth. But uh, there is that, uh, that area that we're looking hard to see if we can get there. So I'm working for you. That's awesome. Mike, I moved into, back into Portland after many years, a couple of years ago, and now it go regularly to the Forest Avenue store. And one of the really pleasant surprises for me has been to see the number of immigrants who are working in that store and, uh, and also to experience the really high level of service that those people are providing. And I wondered to what extent that's conscious and, and purposeful on Hannaford's part, but it seems to be at least one of those places where you see a wonderful opportunity for people who are new to Maine or new to the workforce to get an opportunity to get in and, and, and move up and provide for their families. Yeah, great great observation. I certainly share that observation. I'm very proud of the, the staff there. It's really helped us. I mean, it's such a melting pot of a store. We have, uh, we have all different kinds of shoppers. It's the most diverse store that we have. Uh, uh, maybe a little bit in Massachusetts we have some, but we have uh, incredible immigrant population. We have incredible population around the Back Bay area. And when you have that kind of uh, diversity in population, it allows for you to sell a much more diverse product offering and to have a much more diverse associate offering, uh, associate uh, base as well. And uh, we have found the, the work ethic that we, we, we see and the, the, um, uh, the, the workplace has been terrific for, uh, for some of the, the minorities that work there. And, uh, and, and, you know, you sort of uh, 
um, you get a start and you create a good environment and then they tell their friends and they come in and so it's really been a, a terrific experience. You know, our pharmacy, our pharmacist spent, uh, I think he speaks five languages and I was talking to our folks the other day about that and you think about immigrants that come into Portland and they need to get their prescriptions and you know, pretty scary to think, you know, how I, I have to be able to talk to somebody about my prescription. So we work really hard to, uh, to make sure we staff that store with management and, 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 execu and, and specialists that really understand our population base. And it's, uh, it's been a nice win and great associates. And thanks for recognizing that. Where's Amy? Oh, oh, you have a question? Right up by the door we go. So I'm kind of curious to hear, I'm Andy Whitman from Animate, more about uh, Hannaford and sustainability, given how food and grocery really is at the nexus of sustainability in our society. It's one of the biggest issues, you know, I think of our, our day. So I'm sort of curious how, how that figures in terms of Hannaford strategy. I'm, I'm, I, I know your topic was sustainability, but I couldn't hear the question. Just how does sustainability work in terms of Hannaford strategy, specifically the, 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 uh, given the importance of food? Uh, in sustainability issues writ large. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, sustainability is, if you, if you go on to our, uh, Aho Delays is our parent company. If you go onto the website, we have uh, clear goals around sustainability, and we're working towards uh, zero waste by 2020. We have got several zero waste stores in our, in our chain, uh, most notably Coney up in the Augusta region where we, uh, we work really hard uh, to sell all the product we can and order it as efficiently as we can first. And then we work with our local uh, soup kitchens and food bank. Good Shepherd is a major partner of ours. And uh, the work Kristen does and, and Hannaford work very, very closely together. And the related uh, pa food pantries that come in and take all of our fresh products, we're able to deliver. They come in every day and get our produce. Uh, any of the meat that we can't sell, we freeze and, 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 and provide to the soup kitchens that way, our, our day-old bakery as well. And then, you know, we move even further down into uh, if, we can, if we can have the product go to farmers and, and feed livestock, we try to do that and ultimately into compost, uh, working very hard towards our zero waste goals and not only in food but in energy efficiency as well. So uh, very, very important to us, uh, very important to our, our associates and uh, important to the business and we're, we have a significant team that works on sustainability. Thank you. So Mike, um, tell us about your main. So where do we find you on the weekend other than behind the <laughs> deli counter? Well, I think for the next uh, foreseeable future I'll be uh, working on putting lights, you know, hanging pictures in my house and putting a yard in. And uh, So I like to kind of hang out and, and, and do uh, kind of the weekend warrior stuff and projects. Uh, I, I did haul my, my boat up from Lake Norman in Charlotte, and I have it up at the marina on Sebago. So I might be seen on Sebago Lake this summer uh, boating a little bit. And, uh, and I'm not very good at it, but I do like to chase uh, a little white ball around on the golf course whenever I can oh. as well. So, uh, and then we have three terrific daughters, and uh, my wife and I will be traveling a little bit more. One of the downsides of moving is that you drop your kids off along the way. So our oldest is in Chicago. Our middle one is in Tampa. And our youngest is in college in uh, North Carolina and likely will stay in that area. So, uh, so um, You're pretty yeah. busy. Yeah, well, we're pretty busy. Good. Um, oh, and I also wanted to ask you, what is the number one selling item at Hannaford? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to put Harold. you under pressure. Who, who, give me, throw out, who, what do you think the best selling items are? Milk. I think milk. <laughs> <laughs> Alan's coffee. I heard milk. I heard bananas. I heard cheese. Eggs. You got four of the top five. You got bananas already. The fifth one will surprise you, and I think it's actually number two or three in our company is avocados. What? Believe it or not, avocados. But you've got, uh, I think it's an eight ounce uh, uh, shredded cheese, bananas, eggs, milk, avocados. So. So um, thank you all for coming, and thank you to, to Mike. Um. <laughs>Thanks for joining us, and thanks to our sponsors, Bernstein Schur, New England Cancer Specialists, LiveAndWorkInMaine.com, and People's United Bank. For more information on the sponsors, the Like a Boss podcasts, and Like a Boss live events, visit likeaboss.pressherald.com.